assessment that COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. Welcome to Porto Business School's Innovation Day. Two months ago, our Center for Business Innovation and our communication and commercial teams were meeting here in the campus to discuss the final details in our lineup of topics and guests for this event. We had so many great ideas and so many extraordinary insights to share. At that moment, we were all far from thinking that that would have been one of our last presential meetings, and that's pretty soon everybody in the school moved to home office and remote working. In less than three days, Porto Business School transformed itself into a fully digital business school, guaranteeing uninterrupted classes in all our long programs like the MBAs and the post-graduations until the end of the second term. In three days, a fully physical operation was transformed into a fully digital one, managed entirely from each staff member's home involving almost 1,000 students and more than 20 different professors. Since then, so much has happened at Porto Business School. COVID-19 forced us to adjust ourselves to this digital by circumstance reality. And now, for example, we have more than 400 students enrolled in our new set of online executive education programs, which started at the beginning of April. And we just launched a new pioneer digital MBA, the first of its kind in Portugal. Two months ago, we thought that we would be welcoming you all here in our Sonai Auditorium. Two months ago, we thought that uncertainty, digital transformation, or sustainable development and growth were some of the critical issues that organizations and individuals had to deal with. An ultra-microscopic virus is proving us wrong. Rushing to understand the future, the vast majority of us have neglected to realize that we still haven't figured out some old very old problems, like viruses, bacteria, and epidemics and pandemics. Despite that, these old-fashioned biological problems forced us to super-accelerate our digital world. As Porto Business School moved digital, so did many companies, governments, organizations, and individuals. Home office and remote work, online classes, Zoom social gatherings, collaborative tools and crowdsourcing platforms, all these and many other concepts became much more familiar to us all. Suddenly, all our lives outside our four walls became fully digital. Our businesses became digital. Our work became digital. We became digital. In the spirit of this day and age where speed, adaptability and agility become even more essential, we decided that in our innovation day, we should try to figure out this digital everything. So let us start. We asked our Dean, Ramon O'Callaghan, to set the scene and kickstart our collective reflection. Can you believe this? I wanted to be here in person, but here I am at home, at a distance, and welcoming you to the Innovation Day. As you can see, 
This is a special uh, edition. Uh, we didn't want to capitulate to the virus, so we decided to organize this remotely so that you all can attend wherever you are. Two months ago, if you had asked me, we could not have imagined that this event would take place in this form. But of course, today, digital technologies and the effort and hard work of all these beautiful humans at Porto Business School made the impossible possible. As we know, digitalization is changing everything. The way we operate, the way we think, and the way we interact with one another. This Innovation Day is precisely about this, the opportunities that digital technologies offer for society. We will be discussing how individuals, businesses, and industries are being impacted, sometimes disrupted, sometimes wiped away by digital technologies. Yes, we have many new technologies, artificial intelligence, robots, you name it. We should embrace them, but we should remember that people remain at the centerpiece of our lives. The best way to use artificial intelligence is to enhance our own emotional intelligence. The best way to use data is to turn it into knowledge and wisdom. In other words, to make sense. This sense making, all these things are mainly human activities. So welcome to the debate and let's get started. Technology is revolutionizing the way we live and work. Anyone over 40 has lived a life that has more in common with their parents' lives than their children's. The digital revolution is upon us and in full swing. From hybrid cloud, artificial intelligence and machine learning to virtual reality and quantum computing, it's near impossible to stay on top of all the new trends and technologies. The scope of these changes is vast and is global. In this brave new digital world, where does our identity stand? Who are we online? The digital representation of individuals is a much deeper issue than we tend to think in the digital world. The new high fidelity digital humans are being created here in Porto by Didimo. Didimo is a tech startup founded by Veronica Orvalho, an Argentinian scientist that has been working for many years now at the University of Porto. Veronica believes that in a world increasingly intermediated by digital technology, it's time to bring the richness of human communication to every online interaction. Earlier, I virtually sat down with Veronica to understand more about this fascinating approach. Hi, Veronica. Thank you for joining us in our Innovation Day. So, Veronica, let us know a little bit more about this fascinating Didymo. Thank you so much for the invite, and I'm delighted to show you what the Didymo is. So, at Didymo, we create digital characters that follow the likeness of a person. So, our ultimate goal is to be able to give everyone the possibility of have their virtual self and their virtual identity into the digital world that can speak, talk, and move, and can even speak any different language. And what is, what is the technology behind it? So, because uh, the user experience is uh, very simple, you're designing it to be very simple. You do it uh, over a simple photo from our phone, right? Yeah, we can, we can do it uh, of a simple photo or for video, or we can even go as sophisticated as photogrammetry technology. So what we've pretty much done is make available the technology that is usually used at uh, AAA games or Hollywood movies. So we've encapsulated the whole character animation process that usually takes uh, many software engineers and artists and expensive equipment into one simple click. So everything is done in the cloud. So you input a photo and then there is a bunch of processing uh, going on that creates a 3D geometry with all the skin textures and all the control structures so you can animate a character. 
Uh, I remember the first time uh, you explained me about Didymo a few years ago. Um, you, you asked me a question, Rui, what if uh, instead of just texting in WhatsApp, we could have our digital uh, representations talking to each other? So this is, this is all about uh, bringing this, uh, the, the human characteristics of, of communication, uh, humanizing our, our digital interactions and online interactions, right? Yeah, so uh, we created Didymo with one probably huge uh, goal, which is to bring back the empathy and the authenticity uh, into digital communication. So how can we represent ourselves in the more truthful way and wholehearted when we are um, interacting from one person to a computer to another person? Uh, and that is much more than just uh, creating a digital version of you um, in 3D, right? So it, it involves re-educating everyone on how they should behave and communicate. So a very basic thing that I usually say is when we see ourselves on screen, we think twice of what we're going to do and what we're going to say. And today we're hidden behind text messages and emojis, right? So the question is how do we reinvent this digital connection and this digital interaction by bringing ourselves as the main element of uh, communication? This is a, an interesting movement because um, uh, uh, this is all about trying to humanize this this digital world and and this current day and age this has become uh, uh, even more essential. Uh, everybody moved to a digital version of themselves uh, by skyping, by zooming, by by working on Teams and other collaborative uh, platforms. How have you been observing this uh, this movement where suddenly? every single one of us had to uh, uh, super accelerate our digital transition and our digital versions of ourselves. Yeah, so, so pretty much since last year, like December, November last year, we started to get contacted by many companies that were looking into creating digital versions of people on, on, on the digital world, right? But what has just happened in the last month or so was that now people need a faithful representation of themselves. Um, we're not here to replace those, you know, that wants to have a cartoon character, you know, just to play games or so, or, or different issues. No, here is, is the, the need of having a 24-7 availability of someone that is you and that you control, not just an AI. So because with machine learning and uh, um, digital characters, we could create uh, digital versions of people that is not really us. Right? is controlled by an AI, and that's okay too. What we're claiming is that we want to be able to give the people you know, in their mobile devices the possibility of create a faithful representation of who they are that they can control and that they can define how it behaves, and then they can put it into the, back into the digital space to either interact with another person, teach something to someone else, or even use it for their own purposes if they want just to buy clothes, for instance. So. Are you on the path of combining, finally combining artificial intelligence with emotional intelligence? That's, that's yeah, you, you put it right on spot. That's the top of our summit. Yes, yes, definitely. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more. We are very close to, to the end of our, our conversation. Tell us a little bit more. What has been the road uh, of Didymo and what are your next steps? So uh, now we have the core technology. So we're going to be launching it so people can start using it from their mobile devices. But I, I think the, the best I can say is where we aim is we really want to take everyone out of isolation pretty much. Right? So you can be isolated technically, geographically, um, you can be alone at home and hopefully we'll bring a technology that will bring people together back. Veronica, thank you so much. Wish you all thank the you. best for you and Didymo. Stay, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Before COVID-19, millions of dollars and euros were being spent in transformational programs. Companies already understood that disruption was in full swing. Analyzing the volatility in the S&P 500 index, we understand how digital technologies have been leveraging new business models that have created new value in business. In companies, marketing and sales have been grabbing every single opportunity that digital technologies allow them to turn new customers into new revenue streams. Operations have been using automation, the Internet of Things, the technologies that are fundamental in the fourth industrial revolution to enhance productivity and efficiency. In strategy, digital technologies leverage new business models and business model innovation that becomes the new mantra 
for companies. Katharina Reis from our Center for Business Innovation tells us more about the road to digital business. As digital technologies radically reshape industry after industry, digital transformation has become part of every company's agenda. It's a change in operations, in how the value is delivered to customers, but it's also a cultural change that requires organizations to continually challenge the status quo. It's a permanent discovery process. It's the seizing of new opportunities. It's disruption. It's innovation. To succeed in this journey, the scope of innovation must be expanded to encompass the full business model. It doesn't necessarily mean to transform the entire operation. Sometimes improvements could be specific to particular measures. However, there is a need for a strategic vision and to understand the business model as a whole. The problem is the organization's lack of understanding of the business model, so they don't know whether success relies on specific elements or requires a whole new business model. Nevertheless, within all the possibilities, from channels increasing to value proposition, business model innovation can deliver more lasting competitive advantage. In fact, research has shown that business model innovation can create up to 25 times greater competitive advantage compared to product and process innovation. To drive growth through business model innovation is not a trivial undertaking, but it's a critical one since corporation survival and growth and rethinking the business model are interconnected. Digital technologies are creating new opportunities for organizations to capture, generating means for business to be more efficient and effective, to offer more customized solutions and to embrace new platforms. Despite all critical questions and the inherent risk in all innovative transformations, the real challenge is defining what business model innovation actually entails. Focus very important on this transformation program. So at Wharton, what we selected basically was the um, customer experience side. So transforming the business, changing the way the customer feels, the way Vorton approaches it. So we, that's what we called the design from front to back. So we started thinking about how the company should uh, sell, should uh, behave, should support the customer, this specific contact how it should be centered on the customer side. And then having this decide, we go backwards to the back end, to the back office process. And it's an, a natural process that the things you don't need, you even you, you, you delete it from the path and you focus only on the substantial things you need to do to provide experience to the customer. So the experience of tracking an order. So in the old era or the previous process to track an order, if uh, someone puts an order, places a, an order on at Wharton, he needs to call the contact center by phone. He did not provide any other way to track the order. So we analyze that um, experience and we start to provide not only the lead time, the expected arrival time, but also a track and trace so the client can see where the order is. So you are at the same time transforming the customer experience, improving it, and at the same time, you reduce costs in the organization because you avoid a call in a contact center. So you use the time of your people in more value-added things to the customer. For me, uh, the, the best uh, advice I could give you, anyone, is to understand what could be the to be vision. So what will be the final stage for your company in particular? Because each company has a, a different starting point and different needs. So be very clear for your company what will be the to be vision and start uh, small start small so 
uh, understand, get a focus, what do you need to, to do just to run a pilot, understand what you learn from this experience because it, it provides you a lot of insights how to handle the big pieces that come after that. So suggesting is this, um, set a clear vision and then start with a small part so you can learn about the uh, typical parts of your company to understand how you will draw after that period of the pilot how to handle the big program. Que esta questão da, da digitalização tem que partir de uma estratégia bem delineada e bem consolidada. A Alberto já passou por, por alguns processos, está a passar neste momento também eh, na parte da automatização dos armazéns, um, que era tudo feito manualmente, não é? desde as faturas, desde a introdução de, das guias, portanto, tudo era feito de uma forma manual. E o que nós estamos a fazer hoje já é semi automático, ainda não tanto como eu gostava, porque gostava de ter um armazém completamente robotizado, mas hei de lá chegar, e depois com todas as vantagens que, que, que a automação traz, não é? Portanto, desde aumentar a eficiência, desde aumentar a satisfação dos clientes, desde a vantagem competitiva com que nós ficamos relativamente a outras empresas, desde a simplicidade de processos. Alguém que queira abrir uma texto, ele deve logo começar a sua estratégia pela automação, porque senão é uma empresa que vai morrer. E quando nós estamos a falar destes processos, estamos a falar de processos de toda a cadeia de valor. Ou seja, quando falamos com os nossos fornecedores, nós tivemos que educar, digamos assim, os nossos fornecedores a entregar como nós queríamos. Custou no início, mas isto é vantajoso para todos, principalmente a nível de controle e de informação na hora, online. Custa, ao início, claro que custa, mas é uma questão de, de hábito e lá está, de, de perceber as vantagens e de, e de sermos muito fortes com aquilo que queremos, para garantir efetivamente que as coisas são bem implementadas. Fala-se muito do vocal goal, mas cada vez mais vivemos numa lógica de ambiguidade, de uma necessidade imperiosa de, de, de agilidade e de capacidade de adaptação e, e, e a capacidade que nós temos que ter em termos de time to market, de, de, de introdução de novos produtos, de adaptação de produtos, de novos processos, de novas formas. Eu acho que nunca, como hoje, temos que pensar from scratch, pensar numa folha de papel em branco e se calhar não olhar para aquilo que fazíamos e tentar extrapolar ou tentar exportar da forma que nós fazíamos, mas pensar de uma forma completamente numa folha em branco. Porque processos de inovação e processos de, 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 de entrega de valor hoje em dia num ambiente tão ambíguo é, é, é muito difícil. Portanto, eu acho que hoje em dia esta questão do VUCA World veio mesmo para ficar e, e os modelos de negócio hoje em dia têm que viver mesmo com a questão da ambiguidade e com a capacidade de se adaptarem a todo momento. Aquela, aquela lógica de termos ciclos de vida de produto longos, ciclos de vida de clientes longos, ciclos de vida de processos, de decisão de compra longos, coisas hoje em dia... Todo, tudo isto acontece de uma forma muito mais rápida e muito mais ágil e com necessidades muito maiores de adaptabilidade às necessidades constantes do mercado. Isto porquê? Porque a tecnologia veio para ficar e esta quarta revolução industrial do que assenta a lógica do Big Data, do, 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 do IoT, da, da questão da Artificial Intelligence, está-nos a exigir muito a nós, especialmente marketeers. What are the traits, the characteristics and skills of digital leadership? EY's latest research on leadership finds that companies that excel at digital transformation share common habits. Being a digital transformation leader does not guarantee financial success, but there is a strong link between these actions and better financial performance. That is also linked with three new dimensions of value creation in the transformative age. All three go hand in glove with the habits of digital transformation leaders. Humans at Center is a critical value driver that connects with the wider idea of the human enterprise. Technology at speed links with accelerating artificial intelligence to drive growth and powering innovation by leveraging data and being agile. And innovation at scale ties into driving innovation through ecosystems and partnerships. 96 of the 500 corporates in this research were defined as digital transformation leaders. These leaders say their transformation is fully embedded and optimized across the business today. Leaders agree that they have brought technology innovations to markets that have generated 
significant financial value for the business. And innovation has woven into their business. But are leaders really prepared? MIT Sloan and Cognizant surveyed more than 4,000 global leaders to explore what the future of work pretends for the future of leadership. They identified three fundamental reasons leaders aren't as ready to lead in the digital economy as they think. A deficiency in digital savviness coupled with outdated mindsets. A series of blind spots that prevent them from seeing a clear path forward and multiple embedded tensions that undermine strategic execution. 71% of the respondents agree that they are personally prepared to lead in the digital economy. Yet the same group scores significantly lower when asked whether they possess specific digital skills, such as using analytics to influence their decision making or advocating for the use of machine learning in their organization's operations. We can say there is a gap between the digital dream and the digital reality. Regarding leaders' top behaviors, three are identified as most relevant. Some time-tested leadership attributes and behaviors, ethics, trust and integrity among them, are still viewed as critical in the new leadership playbook. This MIT Sloan Management Survey results show that the most important behavior in leading teams is, by a wide margin, trust. In today's high-pressure environment, where competitors can come from anywhere, from multiple countries and sectors, leaders are focused on continuous improvement and innovation. Moreover, technology is helping them implement these competitive strategies. Most have already made significant investments. Business transformation will gain momentum and become more successful as organizations create conditions for change. The new decade ahead of us could be the moment in which the cultural, technological and market barriers finally come down. More than ever, leadership is critical for any future-focused organization. One of the main drivers of our new digital MBA is exactly the notion that digital leadership and management requires a specific skill set and tool set that enhance performance. Over the past weeks, during our series of webinars at Porto Business School, leadership has been a recurring topic. We spoke about it with Mark Fritz, Babis Menemelis and Silvio Meira. Digital leadership actually writes the leadership in code. If you can't code your leadership, you are not leading. A digital leader in a market, from the point of view of a business, is the leader of writing the code of that market. As soon as you start doing that, you are nearly unbeatable in the current setting of your market unless someone does some kind of radical innovation or disruption on top of your business model. I think that uh, uh, we saw happening before, and my feeling is we'll be moving more. Uh, leadership, instead of having one leader, we'll be moving toward more, uh, more collaborative leadership models in many companies. Um, so instead of having just one person decide, we have more, more collaborative leadership. Uh, you still have leaders, I cannot imagine uh, organizations not having leaders, but it's becoming more collaborative in some forms, in some places, it is becoming more integrative. So you get lots of experts, lots of good minds. Someone has to run the show, but, uh, you know, uh, everybody has a chance to uh, to contribute. And part of what great leaders do is to be able to elicit good ideas and then find a way to integrate them. All the leaders have to be more outcome focused. I mean, you have to get people to, to own the key outcomes uh, and you have to enable them to be able to take action and make decisions and collaborate more on their own because you can't be in the middle of everything at a distance. And um, the easiest way to think about outcome versus activity focus and so forth is to think about what you hear when everybody sets up a meeting. You know, when everybody sets up a meeting, they say, we need a meeting to discuss something. 
And, and discussion is an activity, it's not an outcome. And the best thing you can do as a leader meeting people from anywhere is to run very good meetings and be very clear at the top of the meeting what you want to achieve. One of the most uh, important uh, things that we expect and companies expect from the leaders to do is to be able to think, who are we, what is that we're offering, what are the needs of, of our customers, how have they changed? And this is a kind of a thinking process. And, you know, I, I very much like the, the act of thinking. I think great leaders think, think of fresh ways, think in new ways, think uh, in ways that perhaps they didn't think in the past. And I think this is a very timely um, period uh, to be able to do something like that. The best leaders are the ones who understand themselves because in a virtual environment, one person cannot be the perfect for everything. In other words, you can be visionary, but you have to put someone operational next to you to, to counteract some of your weaknesses that way. And digital is all about new methods of work, new methods of deciding stuff, new systems of technology and platforms and networks. It's about new KPIs. It's about new ways of thinking about users. It's about abiding to regulatory frameworks that are for real, are here now, and are the big new novelty to decide upon digital business models that are actually going to be scalable and sustainable in the long term. The start of empathy and everything is listening to the other people. So they don't necessarily see, have to see them all the time. You have to listen. And think about this. If, if someone doesn't listen to you, how do you feel? You know, you don't feel great. You know, listening values the other person. And in this time, um, we can't just have uh, operational meetings. We have to call people up and say, how are you doing? How's everything going? And actually just listen to people. And I found that leadership is much easier when you listen because you, you get to see what your people are thinking and feeling. I found if I'm trying to guess what my people are thinking and feeling, I'm always less than 50% if I'm guessing. If I'm asking questions and listening, it's, it's much better. Visibility is very motivating. If everybody knows you did a great job and you make it visible across the whole organization, uh, they have people feel pride. So they're gonna feel much more uh, that way as well. If you don't have a strategy, you have nothing. It's useless to buy and install stacks of code. It's strategy and cultural transformation. That's what digital acceleration actually is. Having your people, the entire people in your business, in all, in all parts of it. It's not the core. It's not the guys in technology. It's not the guys in marketing. It's everybody understanding what digital is all about. What makes people trust their leaders? What makes people get inspired by leaders? What makes people believe in leaders? And uh, there are lots of different things, but uh, their uh, intellectual ability, their intellectual competence, usually tends to be very, very important. So you know that your leader understands what's going on. In a situation like this, where you know sometimes people start to ask me, what the hell is going on? What's happening? Uh, a leader must also be, be capable to, to be able to provide that type of cognitive, uh, I wouldn't say certainty, but at least some form of stability. Some of okay, people know that the way he or she is a leader or as a team of leaders look at the world, they really trust that. And then other things can really follow from that. So the emotional part, the part of uh, empathy, the part of supportiveness, the part of uh, making people uh, feel safe is very, very important. But in situations like this, um, trusting, that our leaders have some type of mental control of the world, not other forms of control, but in terms of mental control, if you understand what's going on, I think this is one of the most reassuring people leaders can, can provide to the teams. Because then the team says, you know, okay, this guy knows what's going on. So basically who can trust? And other things can, uh, can follow after that, and build on that. The strong consequence of massive digital technology adoption has been the fast evolution in organizational culture. As we just saw, leaders fully understand that. Digital culture goes beyond the day-to-day -day acts of doing digital work. 
it describes something broader and subtler than that. It involves the appreciation, the exploration, and the shared enjoyment of the various digital tools, environments, and artifacts which inform and facilitate our work. A flourishing digital culture is a tremendous asset to any organization, and it can help facilitate everything, from the ready acquisition of new digital skills amongst team members, to the bettering of the digital environment in which they work. The autonomy enhanced by digital technologies needs to serve the purpose of alignment and delivery. And the sense of belonging, the identification and the shared consciousness amongst the co-workers require a new set of approaches and skills. Here is Cathy Santana from the Center for Business Innovation and the director of our Organizational Culture and Change online program with more insights about digital culture. To better understand this topic, we asked our community to get involved and submit their questions about the importance of having a digital-driven culture in today's organizations. We have selected three students that responded to our call and sent us their video questions. To answer them, we have three guests with first-hand knowledge on the subject. I would like to ask you a question about those companies who were not born digital and that are only starting now their path towards digital transformation. We know that some companies were forced to become more digital when this pandemic started. After this phase and looking to the near future, what kind of effects or impacts do you believe that the digitalization process might have in the organizational culture of those companies? Uh, so I think that for a lot of the companies that were not digital in the beginning and are doing a more accelerated transition to digital right now because of the pandemic, I think there's going to be a lot of different effects. So the first one might be the saddest one, which might be that some companies cease to exist because they can't adapt fast enough or because the markets in which they were um, no longer exist or no longer present the opportunities that they had uh, before the pandemic. Um, for the other companies, I think it's going to be a mix between accelerating some processes that would happen anyway um, throughout time, but would take a longer time to eventually materialize. And now they're going to happen in, I don't know, a few months or a few weeks where normally it would take a few years. That's going to make that uh, a lot of these companies will have to go through a reskilling process where some of their employees were, we had a set or a set type of skills or a set uh, profile will have to be trained to be able to deal with other um, different challenges that the online environment is going to bring. And then there's going to be, um, I would say, a, a fundamental change in, in the way that people are going to relate with each other. And they're going to have to learn how to use chat communication tools where normally they would shout across the room or they would have to um, learn how to collaborate on an online document where normally they would be using Word or in their own computers and asking the colleague over to come and see it. As I said, I think this would happen anyway. It's just that the biggest difference is that it is going to happen in a much shorter time frame with a lot of other variables around it with the economic crisis, with like the instability around it, which is going to make it harder. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think um, resilience is going to prevail and a lot of these companies are going to find ways uh, to adapt. Obviously, the older ones or the ones that are less flexible are going to suffer the most. Digitalization can and will, I believe, create a more distributive, collaborative and agile organizations. And digitalization makes it easier to bridge the silos and to manifest trust and empowerment over command and control and as well as to develop and share the virtues and the benefits of the agile methodology and self-managed teams. Um, the COVID epidemic gave companies and youth most traditional companies the sense of urgency and the openness to new ideas, new forms of knowledge arising from different sources and new experiments. For a company that is already halfway through the digitalization process and has employees working both at HQ and remotely, how does it maintain its culture, especially for the employees working remotely? So the three main uh, points for this unified culture is to have a, a really strong sense of, of purpose, why you are willing to do a business and why you are working for that company. 
For example, at DOT, we are helping others uh, to grow. This is really strong, it grow through e-commerce. The second pillar is to design a community experience. When a candidate has this, his very first uh, interview and then uh, goes on board and has all the career paths with us, all the, the points from benefits or work workplace or other points or evaluation or feedback, they need to really be uh, really well defined so we can provide the best experience for for this person and then the third is the rituals in the every day rituals such as challenge that person such as demonstrating gratitude or celebrating uh, milestones all these rituals are um, really important so you can have this unified um, sense of culture I think that it's fundamental to understand that virtual is different from in-person, okay? And that's why empathy and creativity are so important in this context when we are thinking on how to boost company culture. We have to mobilize people, as I was saying, uh, because now the company itself, uh, the office for instance, is not so much of a tangible reality as we are working from home. We don't see the office, you see? And so it's very important to make it tangible, to make it real for, for, for the people. So I think it's very important to find something that brings people together and share a purpose, uh, share a vision, uh, and share it repeatedly in as many different ways as possible. So I think it's about uh, everyone feeling like they have the same value for the company. So the company needs to make sure that discussions are happening on a digital environment most of the time. There's no like offline decisions being made that people feel left off. And that as much as possible, there's a mix, there's a, a rotation between the people working remote and the people working at HQ. To put in mind that purpose is key, audience is very important, context is crucial. People trust that huge crises bring huge opportunities. Bold entrepreneurs might want to take a chance now to launch their own business and digitalization, now more than ever, is seen as the best option. How can be created a healthy organizational culture with sense of belonging, commitment and enthusiasm in a digital-born project? We need to understand companies are not an abstract thing. They're a mix of people. And they're going to be a mix of like the different personalities. There's people that are going to be like super happy being close at home and working from their computers. And there's going to be people that are like, it's really hard for them. And being able to respect and create that space is sort of the first step uh, towards success. I think the second thing we see is hiring. Hiring becomes so much more important because you need to hire the kind of people that would strive and that would be set for this kind of remote environment. Um, and also you need to hire people that you trust because trust becomes so, so important. Like you can't look over the shoulder of what people are doing at that point. So you really need to trust that people are going to do that work, that people are going to show up, that people are not going to be watching Netflix while we think they're working. Um, then I think it, it, it boils down to communication. So always trying to do calls with videos, uh, making sure there's one-on-one uh, conversations as much as possible. So there's this concept of like so, sort of blind dates between people so they can get to know each other based on their, on their profiles and what they like to do. And I think for management, there needs to be this uh, constant care of like trying to feel how the person is feeling, um, respecting their mental health needs, respecting that they have a space and a time where they're trying to mix between their personal and professional lives. And, and making good use of real-time tools. So there's GIFs, there's MEMS, there's things you can, you can sort of share amongst everyone. There are kind of the digital equivalent of what you would have in the real world where like people would hang around like the coffee machine and tell a joke. Now you're basically doing the same thing, but you're doing it um, in a digital platform and you need to incentivize and show people that this is not like lost time because it's visible to everyone but this is actually something that we, we, we want to have. For example, when we are recruiting someone, uh, we are inviting them to work with us. Uh, that person needs to be very aligned with the, the, the purpose that we have. If the, the, mindset, the mindset is a, it's aligned with us, it's easier. 
So I think it boils down to trust, communication, and physical contact. So like trust, you really need to trust the people you're hiring. You need to trust they're going to do good work. Communication, you need to have open channels for communication, force people to do video calls every now and then so that they can see each other and feel each other. Make sure that there's the real-time communication tools for them to connect with each other and for the group to connect and share memes and pictures and, and their hobbies and whatnot. And then I think that the third one is really there, there should still be an opportunity for people that are in the same city to get together for people to go to a co-working space and work from there so that they, even if they don't feel a sense of community 100% within the company, they feel it on their own local communities. There are two things that are really important. One is the purpose. If we identify with the purpose with the company. And second is the attitude. The attitude to make it happen. Uh, if you don't have the, the, the answer to that challenge, you will search, you will find, you and you will deliver. I think it's connection. I think that connection is the key word because you need to be connected uh, by technology but I think that most importantly, you need to be connected by heart. Communication, open and honest with a lot of trust between all stakeholders so no one is left behind. And in the end, it's all about people. One person at a time. Digital everything requires individual transformation. It requires a new mindset, a new skill set and a new tool set. Ines Sista from the Center for Business Innovation went out there to find the digital us. The future is brimming with opportunities. And as digitalization is revolutionizing everything, from the most pressing intellectual and emotional experiences to some of the most ordinary and everyday aspects of existence, we believe it's more important than ever to don't forget the human side. After all, digital transformation isn't about technology. It's about humans. It's about people. It's about us. Welcome to the future. With that in mind, we asked for members of Port Business School community on how they're adapting to digitalization and what really did change in their life. started working uh, so some years after I had the need uh, to, to improve my education digitally so this is why I did my, my post graduation in digital marketing precisely because of that because I really felt I was lacking behind if I didn't had some some new expertise on, on digital on digital means um, when when I for example when I started working um, it was in an international marketing uh, team Everything was about producing brochures and uh, and printed outlets for everything. We, we were doing a lot of trade trade shows and 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 fairs, so all the the marketing materials were printed. So we were super worried about um, editorial editorial content and how to print it and all the materials. And now, uh, almost ten years after. I can say that it's super, super rare um, to produce this kind of material. So everything that we do in terms of internal and external communication um, is digital. We use uh, internal TVs in the office. We use uh, uh, social media, both internally com and, and, and then externally. Um, the way we communicate both with external audiences and, and internal ones, the email is, is, is key. So actually, we, we, we may have... We we may produce some some printed and some physical materials, but the truth is that I would say that uh, 70, 80 percent of the communication we do is uh, through digital means. I really feel that we run the risk to 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 replace the the moments that we should have with our family, especially with our friends. Uh, now that we are always connected through Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp. Uh, Instagram and other social media sometimes okay so I speak with this person every day so now I don't have the chance to 
I don't I don't have the need sorry to 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 be with to be physically with, with this person because we are connected all the, all the time so what uh, and in the office it's the same thing we run the same risk so if we make everything digital uh, people won't meet face to face so I will be with my team and that would be it. So this is why we, we really need to find the right balance. Uh, of course, most of our communication will always be digital, uh, and, and I really think that it it will it will be the same way in the next few few years ahead of us. But we need to find the right balance by promoting, uh, especially events, face to face events, and gatherings, and meetings, and talks, and workshops something free uh, for, for people to freely meet and connect without having, having something very heavy or very formal behind it. Uh, the factory's operations will be transformed by one of the technologies that I think is one of the most interesting to, to, to have uh, our eyes upon, which is uh, collaborative robots, cool robots. So the fact that you might have in the future a robot and a human together in the same operation executing the same thing together not one and then the other no but together one uh, maybe hanging a piece the robot and then you are maybe screwing the thing so doing things which are more precise having these two entities together will also uh, will make us look at the digitalization of factories beyond the numerical part and we'll have to actually complement with the human side so we say in the first case, in the e-commerce interface, I think is one of these vibrant fields that um, that we really need to, to watch, to learn, and, and to progress. How do we actually, as humans, uh, perceive the cooperation with, of the machine? How can we schedule the machine in order for the human to feel, to, to, to have a, a higher degree of acceptance of what is going on there? So if we are able really to intertwine these two entities and bring the best out of them, which is the flexibility of the human side with the preciseness of, of the machine, we definitely have, we will step up the game in the operations field. And, and uh, connecting to your words, I think the human interface also goes downstream when we talk again on, on the e-commerce side, right? Because you want to understand the consumer behavior. You want to understand if he values more a precise slot um, when you are asking groceries to be delivered to your house or, or instead of preciseness, maybe you want a quicker lead time. You want to get delivered in the next hour. Is it precision or is it lead time? And you see, understanding well what the customer really wants, in this case, preciseness or lead time, will actually impact how you strategically think about operations. What your operation strategy will differ a lot if you think uh, uh, on these different levels. So you see, understanding better the customer, I think, will allow us to do a better designing of, of, our, of our supply chain. And that's where I really see the, 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 the digital world interconnecting to the operation side. The first thing is to never adquire the knowledge of everything. Today, in the digital world, digital every day there is a new thing, a new concept, a new approach. And so, we are, I am, at least, continuously learning. I am not stopping learning. I am a continuous learning formation. Uh, what I have learned today, maybe in two or three years, will be updated. And so, I have a enormous need to remain relevant, to read a lot, absorb a lot of reports, absorb a lot of studies, have contact with many partners, talk a lot with many partners. I learn a lot with my partners. E, portanto, esta questão, se me permite alguma humildade e dizer eu não sei tudo, gostaria de saber muito mais e, portanto, se eu quero saber muito mais, tenho que aprender com quem sabe e tenho que partilhar experiências. Esta é a primeira questão, que liga muito à segunda, que é, eu, eu há muitos anos que aprendi que não consigo fazer tudo sozinho. E, portanto, eu acho que as equipas são críticas no sucesso dos projetos. E outra terceira coisa que eu costumo dizer é, eu não tenho medo de falhar. Eu não tenho medo de falhar. Eu sei que vou falhar, mas não posso ter medo de falhar. E, portanto, eu experimento. Ou seja, eu tento a todo momento abordar novas, ter novas abordagens ao mercado, ter novas, utilizar novas ferramentas. Sou extremamente exigente relativamente a isso. Portanto, eu impunto, eu, 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 eu tento aponturar o departamento, as pessoas que estão à minha volta, tentarem arriscar, tentarem fazer diferente, trazerem ideias novas. Porque eu acho que é importante que no meio de muitas ideias há, há dois ou três que se anos vão manter verdadeiramente diferenciadores e à frente da, da onda. Digital everything. From the way we do business to the way we work. From the way we teach and learn to the way we interact with each other. 
As we have been saying for many years now at Porto Business School, the most important word in digital transformation is transformation. And transformation is inherently a human endeavor. That is why now is the time to place human experience at the center of this digital everything. Digital is helping us to transform physical distancing into social proximity. Digital is helping us to turn individual fear into community-enabled trust. Digital is helping us to turn companies from closed systems of productivity and efficiency into open collaborative ecosystems of positive impact. Digital is helping us to turn customer care into a deep care about customers. Digital for business growth is an inevitable undertaking. Digital for sustainable development is a desirable mission. Digital for social good is an unstoppable movement. This is what we believe in at Porto Business School. Since the beginning of ages, humankind has been looking at the future to anticipate change, change to build resilience and to create opportunities. Today, it is commonly understood that the future lies in technology and, and that, that the ongoing technological, technological revolutions will make the world a better place. We have been saying this for 250 years. Since the first industrial revolution. revolution. So what's new? The speed of change and its impact in what's new and, and unique, unique in this transformational period. Evolution is no longer linear, it's, it's exponential. Technology breakthroughs on artificial intelligence and quantum computing, data science and, and the Internet, Internet of things, things are combinatory and interdependent. We now know that humankind will, will change, change more, more in the next 20 years than in the previous 300. Business as usual is no longer good enough. And good enough is that it is time to be liquid. To learn just in time, not just in case. To do complete transformation, not single improvements. To create ecosystems, not individual systems. The future lies in technology, but the bigger future lies in transcending it. Innovation is not technology, technology is a tool. Innovation is creativity, is defiance, is questioning why not and what if. That is why now is the time to place human experience at the center of possible and preferred futures. To make the most of this brave new world, focusing on what distinguishes us as humans. At Porto Business School we are identifying signs, trends and drivers to illustrate how changes in the world today could shape us whole tomorrow. We are establishing well-informed and future-oriented perspectives that help stimulate, guide and inspire innovation, innovation strategic planning and, and critical, critical decision-making. We aim to better anticipate change by equipping companies and individuals with, with the skills, skills and resources needed to ask provocative questions, to challenge the status quo, to test assumptions, to, to rethink, rethink opportunities, opportunities and reset goals. Today's trends hold tomorrow's opportunities. So, we are empowering organizational change and agents of change by enabling the skills, resources and, and confidence, confidence to, to explore, explore uncertain, ambiguous and amorphous future scenarios. Whether uncovering gaps in organizational knowledge and capacity or challenging, challenging existing solutions to develop new and better ones. At Porto Business School we are building visions of the possible made real. Change doesn't just happen, we have to make change happen.